do it. Um, once again, for those of you who do not know me, I am Gene Hall. I'm the media services manager at Metro East Community Media. Um, if you ever have to uh, take classes or check out gear, you will run into me eventually. Glenn and I, Glenn is my lovely co-host. Say hi, Glenn. Hello. Um, we run the equipment room where Glenn's sitting now. I'm broadcasting live from my uh, basement bunker and we're gonna do a little intro to GarageBand. And this is actually, this class is designed to really just be an overview. Um, there are a lot of, GarageBand is pretty straightforward. Um, it doesn't, you know, you can, you can score, you can build loops, you can really, I mean, you can, I use it to work on my personal, my, I write songs. Um, I've been a musician since I was 10 years old and uh, I use it, it's a scratch, it's a, it's, a, it's a sketch tool as much as it's a place for me to develop things before I present them to a band. Um, it's really, really versatile. It does have the power to, I mean, people, you know, have released like full blown studio albums nationally on this thing. It's, it's cool. But what I want to do here today is just really kind of go through the interface, go through the different, the different approaches to getting um, what you want out of the program. And, um, if, as we go, if you have questions, feel free to jump in um, at any time because the class is small enough that uh, it's not going to take up a lot of time for you to ask questions if I'm like not covering something that you want to know. Um, and that's about that. And right now, I would, um, can you guys just give me a, um, in the chat, let me know if you, who here has experience with GarageBand specifically. If you have some, none, little, no, um, let me know what that is, uh, if you could, just so I know who I'm dealing with and where we're going. And I, everybody knows how to use the chat, I hope. The, uh, there's a little, well, I can't see it, but. Glenn, you you want to re-explain the chat? Yep. So it's at the bottom of the screen. Um, should it should be around where the uh, all the buttons at the bottom are, and it's a little looks like a speech bubble in an old comic strip. So um, yeah, if anyone's having difficulty with that at this stage, you can unmute yourself, and I can help you through it. Um, just let me know. Um, but from, from what's coming through, it looks like none, none, and none but some experience with uh, a few other um, similar type programs like Ableton Logic and, and uh, Cakewalk FL. Awesome. Who's that? Uh, that's uh, Jamie. Cool. Okay. That's great. <clears throat> so that being said, let's get into it. So what I have here open is the basic project window. Um, this is where you will start all your new projects. It's uh, pretty straightforward here. New project, which is what I've got it set up for right now. Um, and the funny thing about GarageBand is they offer Learn to Play, which is if you need some, oh man. Come on, buddy. I need to move this window. You guys can't see this, but like the the um, Zoom window keeps jumping in my way. Um, guitar lessons, piano lessons, whatever. If you want to, if you need that, they've got that. There's a lesson store, but for the most part, your world is going to consist of new project. This is an empty project, and then there are project templates. Now. What's awesome about these is each one of these, and I'm just going to 
just really quick go through these. Um, keyboard collection. They're, well, let's just do it. I'm just going to open them one by one. Um, let's do it. Load the keyboard collection. Now, what this is, is if you have an input device, a MIDI controller of some sort, you can at any time drop into one of these and you can use any of these sampled uh these are all what they look like they are um you've just got a plethora of different options and with each of the projects you get this like with the amp collection it's the same thing if you were putting bringing a guitar in um directly um you've got a collection of amps we'll we'll go we'll get to that I just wanted to show you that interface really quick before I moved on. But with the voice, it's the same thing. If you happen to be doing podcasting or you're doing voiceover work and you need a gravelly voice, there's a set of presets with each one of these. If you're doing hip hop, if you're doing electronic, if you're doing basic songwriter, straightforward stuff, each of these has a set of presets that will always pop up for you. And it does speed up your writing. It makes it like once you get used to it, because you can swap out anything at any time. But if you know that you're basically, I'm going to be a songwriter and I'm going to pop into this songwriter, you know, template and ta-da. Now I've got smart window open, but these guys. So what you see here, if you notice, you've got, this is a drummer and we'll get to that later. This is the internal drummer for um, GarageBand. And it's basically an AI drummer that will bend and you, you know you can shape the drummer to your liking but like i was saying this is the songwriter template so you've got drummer you've got a vocal plate you've got guitar you've got electric guitar you've got bass and then you've got piano you can at any time add anything you want now well let's just leave it there i'm gonna go back to the beginning because I'm going to cover all this, I'm going to come back to all of these things as we get further into the lesson. Um, new project. So what I'm going to do is I'm just basically going to open an empty project and I'm going to go through the layout of the interface so you can see how this all works. Right now, I've got the detail box open down here. And, um, well, I'm going to close that. Let's just open an empty project. So when you open an empty project, the first thing it wants you to do is choose a track type. Um, if you have an input device of any sort, and you're going to go in with a microphone, say, if you're doing podcasting or something like that, this would definitely be the way to go. You would just select you know the microphone and this if you can read it this is the beauty of garage band it spells everything out all the time you record using a microphone or line input or drag and drop audio files which is important because if you have existing audio files that you want to bring in this will be the place that you go and these two are distinct um because the, uh, it's, they're just templates once again they just set you up in a particular way if you don't really know what you're doing but you have a sense of what the rhythm is you might want to start with the drummer um, we'll get to that in a minute too and then there's the midi usb midi input if you have a midi controller of any sort and <clears throat> the one you know i've got a cord or excuse me a kai mpk mini that i'm sitting here with that's what i was playing with earlier um pretty much anything that is a MIDI controller plug and play USB style works. Um, I have yet to find anything that's a MIDI controller that doesn't work with GarageBand. Um, but basically, no matter what you want to do, you're always starting here. And <clears throat> excuse me, this is going to be right here. 
when you're doing this, this is how you set up your basic input device situation. And we will come back to that as well. So right now, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna set up just a basic audio track. I'm just gonna call it input one. It'll ask you if you want to hear or monitor your instrument as you play. I prefer to do that, so I'm just gonna go ahead and create that. <clears throat> because you guys can't see me doing any hotkeys, I'm just pointing and clicking the whole time. And when this class is done, I will send you a short list of um, shortcuts, like key shortcuts, like, you know, simple things like if you want to return to the beginning of a measure when you're working on a track, you just push return and it will always return to the beginning. Um, whatever, if you, you know, things like that. I'll send that to you. But right now, as we navigate the interface, I'm just going to, everything I'm doing is just point and click because that's going to be easier because you can't see my hands. So here we are. Basic layout, basic interface. This is where you're going to start with anything every single time. And I want you to cancel. Um, and I'm going to walk you through all of these things. This might be kind of tedious, but you'll appreciate me later. So I'm going to close that. I'm going to close that. And this, like any other digital audio workstation, has a basic transport controls. We've all seen these. You know, you've got revert, well, rewind, fast forward, forward or fast forward, stop, play, record, and then cycle. Cycle is your friend. Cycles what allows you to loop sections um, at will whenever you feel like if you're playing music or you are editing and you just need to hear just 30 seconds of that particular audio clip, you'll use your cycle function to do that and it'll loop infinitely until you turn it off and tell it to stop. And you see how this yellow bar up here is highlight, highlighted. I always say highlight, bad English. Um, that is the, that's telling you what you're cycling. And uh, I'm dragging it back and forth because you can see that you can like, you can either do that, you can start it anywhere, you can move it around. It doesn't care what it is, it's just one that's on. And if you see it's gray back here, that's memory, just telling you where you were last time. So if you're like, you know, you need to listen to something all the way through, you can do that. And I'll cover that a little bit more as we go on. Um, so those are basic transport controls. The display area is going to give you a sense of where you are. If it's music, you see here it says bar and beat. So it tells you which measure you're in. And this tells you where the head is. So you can see here as I move along, now I'm in measure three or bar three, crossing over into bar four, beat two. This is a four, four measure. And it tells you the key signature. Um, also tells you the tempo. All of these things are manipulative. You can manipulate everything. Everything, like if you see what I'm doing, I'm just holding my mouse down and I'm like scrolling the tempo. So if you're a songwriter and you're doing your songwriting thing, you can change tempo at will. Um, up here, time signatures are also displayed. Brief basic time signatures and you know your fours and eights, your three, four, your six, eight, four, four. And then if you really want to get freaky, you can make them yourself in the custom mode. That's super cool. This over here changes, so it changes the project display, like it changes the display area. So right now it's beats in the project. You can also do beats in time. So if you need, and this is really helpful if you happen to be doing um, film work or if you're doing, well, if you're doing like a radio spot or something and you're just working in time code, this guy's really helpful for that. It still wants to give you, you know, the bars and beats, but um, you can do that. You can also do just the beats if you're working with 
if that's what you're doing. If you're working with, you know, electronic music or something and you just need to look at beats, you can do that. And you can also look at just specifically time. And you notice that up here, whatever you're, right now, this is now in seconds. This guy right here, the slider, moves you in and out of time. And you can see that's 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 25, so on. So that, actually I use that quite a bit. I move around constantly depending on what I'm doing because when I'm editing, I have different needs. So this, I, I don't even notice what I'm doing and I just change to whatever I need to see. <clears throat> um, this guy right here, tuning fork. If you are going in with an instrument that's plugged in like a guitar or a bass or something, um, right now it's trying to tune my voice and good luck, but uh, that's what that's doing. It's a live real-time tuner. So if I happen to have a guitar plugged into this track and I want to tune it before I get going, just turn that on, comes up, tells you you're in input one, if that's what, you know, wherever your input is, and it's going to, yeah, you can mute and then unmute. But yeah, that's what the tuner does just tunes. Um, this is the metronome and the count-in display. If you are starting to record, oh boy, we're super slow there. That's great. If you're starting to record, what this does is this count-in, I'm going to delete that. Um, select, delete, always works. Return gets you back to the beginning. So the one, two, three, four here is a count in. If you need a minute to, um, it's like a lead in. So if you just press record, like right now, if I just press record without the count in, it just starts right in the beginning. And believe it or not, this is actually recording my voice. I'll show you. See how the metronome is going over it the whole time? I can turn off the metronome. Start from the beginning. And there's my distant, faded, faraway voice. But if I were to use the count in without the metronome even, and then start a record sequence back to the beginning with return, record, it gives you, in this case, because this is a 4 4 measure, it gives you four counts before it leads in. So three, four, go. And now we're recording. So that's very useful. And if you notice it, the metronome actually counted those four beats off. Um, even if you don't need, like if you're not doing music, this can be useful. If you just need a second to get your stuff together, this is where this comes in really, really handy. Cause if you know, you need a little more time, you just need your number of beats to go up. Just, I don't know, make it six beats and make it a six, four measure. And then it's still going to count in it for though. Like so. Before it starts. Oh no, it did full six. So I was right. I never do that. I always play in four four, but well, not always, but anyway, long story short, that's how you use that. And it's really useful when you need a minute to get your thoughts together or whatever, lead into a song, get into the groove, whatever you're doing. And the metronome is just the metronome. Like it just does what it says it does, just like you just heard it. Um, gives you the tempo as you need it at whatever you've got dialed up here in the tempo display. And so I turned off the lead in, the count in, and And those little beats are the metronome or the garage band recording the metronome. You don't have to do that. Anyway, that's what that does. This guy over here, this is your master output. This is your master volume. Um, right now you see this little, the uh, meter here is because I've got the microphone on, the microphone's on over here. And I'm, I'm gonna mute myself so we don't have to listen to that. But that's, you notice when I muted myself, there's no longer green audio bouncing there. 
So there's no, now when I mute myself, there's nothing coming in. This is the master volume output. Um, this is, doesn't matter how many tracks are coming in, this is the end point. This is where everything goes to your master volume. It's always gonna be the uh, place that you're working toward. And right now, let's see, if you click it, you can see that you click and hold, it's at 0.3 dB. Typically, you wanna just start off at a zero. So option click always gets you back to zero. It's kind of a theme around here. I can do it over here too, option click, and puts me back to zero. I'm going to drag, drag this over so you can see that again. Right here, hold down, option click, there you go, back to zero. Um, this is a notepad if you need to take notes, like as you're going. And you have to actually click in the box, and you can take notes. Do it. That's always there. Doesn't matter. Song to song, track to track, you can take notes however you want. <clears throat> this guy right here is the loop browser. And if you're into looping music, this is where things get really, really fun. Um, you can see here right now I've got six thousand four hundred and seventy eight items. Um, it's just the entire loop pack, all genres, and you can listen to them if you just kind of click on them. That's Arcade Dreams. Noise Sweep. This is a yellow, so it's a drummer named Austin. That's just the sound effect door. All of it's here right now. Everything's just here. There's obviously 6,500 things. Um, the loop packs, you select either your genre. If you're doing, you know, rock and blues, you go back to an instrument, you're building something and you're like, I just need the uh, electric guitar for this. And then you go in here and you're gonna get, this actually changes based on key. That's something to remember about the loop packs. They, there are different sounds, like if I change key right now, if I go to B minor, 44 items. If I go to E flat minor, there are 90 items. And so classic attitude rock 18. <laughs> yep, that sounds super attitude-y. Basic electric strum. Kurt Cobain, yep. So you can do that and you can modify these by your descriptors. So if you don't like distorted and you just want a clean electric guitar, well, you've only got three top options there. Um, seems sad. So if you want to go to grooving, you can go there. Oh, look, you've got 42 items. This, it, you can do this all day. There are tons of options. And this loop pack, if you just open up your Mac and you've never used GarageBand, you might not have, and I'm going to kill all of that, um, like 6,600 different loop packs. I'm going to go back to C major. Um, unless you download all of these. And in order to download these, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so that's this basic view. You can also do this view if this is more comfortable, the column view. Still the same thing. Like you go to instruments and go to acoustic bass and get you this. But you know your panel sort of layout and then column view. That's the loop packs. They're always tucked away in there. And then there's your media browser. And this is gonna give you, you know, all your basic any actual garage band projects are gonna land down here. Um, you can move this if you don't need it, or you can make it the whole thing or whatever. Anyway, and then it's also going to give you access to whatever. So you've got your garage band that comes up first. And then your media, basic media, whatever you've got. If you've got music that you're dragging in, if you've got movies, if you you know, editing movies, whatever. And then you can do audio or movies. And so that's your media browser. 
just like that. That's how that works. Any questions before I keep going at a rapid fire pace? I'm trying to go as slow as humanly possible. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat um, a little bit ago. Uh, somebody asked, uh, do you do you recommend any specific MIDI controllers or then any that work like particularly well with uh, GarageBand? Uh, I really mean it. It's, I have yet to find one that doesn't. Um, I had a cheap no-name brand USB keyboard that cost me like 20 bucks off of Amazon like four years ago. I don't even know what it was, plugged it in, totally worked. Terrible action, no control, whatever. It just worked. I have yet to find anything. Um, you know, what we have at, uh, we have uh, Korg keyboards, uh, three octave keyboards, and then we have the, or four octave, and then we've got the uh, Kai MPK Mini that I discussed earlier. That's what we have at Metro East, but they are in no way the standard. There is no standard. Garage Man's kind of like, you tell me. Okay. Um, and the other question, I suppose it, it's, it's pretty much been answered by that, but can you hook up a, a keyboard to this? And I suppose it's, if it- As long as it has a USB out. Okay. I mean, you can hook up a keyboard. Uh, it, it depends on how you set up, once again, and I'll go over here to the new tracks. It's how you set the tracks up. So if you were going to go in with a keyboard direct, I would probably actually, you know, yeah, I would do this, just make, because if you use the guitar input, even though it's for an audio instrument, it gives you guitar stacks. Now, lots of keyboard players play through guitar stacks and get like super cool sounds, that's a thing. But if you're just like, your keyboard does not have a USB out and it only has like a quarter inch line out or something like that, then your input interface will allow you to record just using a basic, just like that. You'll still get audio one and two. This is just a basic interface and you'll be able to record whatever you want. Good. All right, that's it for the chat questions. If anyone has anything else they want to add before we move on. Cool. All right, all right. Um, okay, so these guys over here, we're going to get into this. Uh, I didn't start with these because these guys over here, you're going to live in this world. These are not unimportant and you'll see why. This is the library panel and based on whatever you have over here, the library panel is going to um, always give you access to whatever, if I do this right now, I'm just gonna do it and say I have a guitar and I'm gonna say this. So right now I just selected guitar. And if you see in the library panel, because I have the, the guitar track selected, clean guitar, and then I get all these options. Crunch guitar, all these options. These are amp modelers. I can just plug my guitar straight into this right now. And if I wanted to bore you, I actually would. But anything I select over here, I get all of these different options. And you see what's happening down here in Smart Panel. Like for those of you that are familiar, that looks like, it says British stack, but that looks like a Marshall amp to me. Classic Drive also looks like a Marshall amp. Now that, that looks like a Fender Tweed. This guy up here, same thing, crunch guitar. You can do this all day. That's what it does. It gives you, uh, the library gives you access to this library. And you'll notice I can just go up here and also just switch through. That looks like a Vox. Um, various versions, looks like an orange, of whatever. And then if you're in audio, doesn't give you the same amount of, because audio is basically whatever you put in, whatever you plug in. So you don't have the same amount of uh, 
options in the library, but you still have some options because it's assuming you're going to be vocal, straightforward acoustic guitar, maybe electric guitar and bass through a mic. And then you can make user patches if you're doing your own thing, whatever that may be. So I'm going to close this smart window. And I'm going to close the library. And I'm going to get rid of that. So this guy right here, it's the quick help button. As you're getting to use or learning GarageBand, this guy right here is annoying because everywhere you go, it tells you what the thing is. And I mean everything, it doesn't matter. Like if something doesn't have a function, then it doesn't tell you what it is, but every single thing. So if you ever don't really know how something works, you can always just return to the quick help button. And it's kind of nice because what it does, if you notice uh, where it says press, it says press command and forward slash for more info, this window opens and it just tells you how to get help or whatever it may be. That's kind of cool. And the other thing it does, every time you roll over one of these, it gives you the keyboard shortcut. Go to beginning button. Play. Record is just R. And that's what in the parentheses there next to the title of each individual button. It just tells you exactly how to get there. Add track button. You know, everything, everything's got a thing. Everything's got a way to do it. So I like to keep that off because uh, it's annoying, but extremely helpful. Smart controls, and we've already seen what smart controls do. And right now, because this is a basic audio track, when you open the smart controls, that's where all of your track controls are. And I'll do this again, do a guitar, open that. Whatever you have selected, is what appears down here in the smart control window. So right now, this is on just basic audio. We don't know what it is. So the computer just assumes, sure, you're gonna need some compression and some EQ and maybe some ambience and reverb and a record level because you're probably gonna record. And here's your input settings for this particular track. And if you are to toggle that right now, you only get one option. Tells you about your monitoring, feedback protection. And then if you've got plugins going on, this is where you would open those up. You can also at any time go to the master track, which this master volume is always related to the master track. So if you need to know what's going on, you can always do that through the smart window down here. And you notice if I go over here to guitar, the track changes based on whatever amp I select. This goes for anything, goes for drums, goes for keyboards, and I'll revisit this constantly because that's what makes this program immense, is the amount of manipulation you can do to any individual sound based on any track you make at any time and like if you jump into electric piano and then it gives you an electronic drum kit sound or an electric, whatever you can just do whatever basically that's what that does you'll also notice that first you have controls which drive intensity mix that's what you're getting out of the instruments you can also switch to eq and you can equalize things when you're mixing, we will come back to that when we discuss mixing a little bit later. There's also a tuning button down here. If you need to tune as you go, just making sure everything's going on the way you want it. There's your pedal board. You can select pedals. You can drop them on your board. You can take them off your board. You can manipulate individual parts of the pedal board. If anybody's a guitar player here, I am. I love this part of this thing. 
on and off button, you know, bypass or whatnot. It's got different settings if you want to find the perfect overdrive. You can just, that's, it will just, we, you can do this all day. And I say this over and over again to people, sometimes I do. I just sit here and play with these things because it's truly insane. Oh, tuner still open. <clears throat> so, that's what that guy does. And the uh, final button, I'm going to close this guy, I'm going to close the library is the editing panel. Editing panel will be your friend once you get into actually editing things. If there was uh, data here, you would see the track, you would see, if you notice here on the left here, you've got zero dB, negative 25 dB plus 25. That would be your waveforms. And then you'll notice the transport, the loop transport monitor up here. So you like, you select, Notice how when I select selected the little loop turns on down here. And if I move it down here, it moves down below because this track is selected. So what we're seeing is the, we should be seeing the waveforms. We're not there yet. We're going to come back to that. But this is what this does. And well, let's just do that. This is also a region. Like if you want to just specifically target a region and we're going to get into regions here in a moment, but regions are the different sections that you record as you go. And if you just, if you, the track will give you track view of everything you've recorded on that particular track. But if you just want one section, you would highlight that section up here, tap region, and then you could edit it. You can cut it, you can paste it, you can manipulate it however you want. You can see down here, you can reverse it. You can also, you know, transpose. If you don't like the key it's in, if it's in C major and you want it in F minor, and you want just that particular region in F minor for just that moment, you go down here and you change it right here. That is the power and the beauty. And then the zoom in slider works the same down here. Zoom way in. Stop it. Just... Sorry, you guys. I'm always finding. Oh, oh yeah, thanks. Um, still works the same. Okay. So, that's that. And then the very last thing here is the actual track itself. And. What just happened there, if I double click the track, the smart window just opens on its own. Whether you click the smart, you can click the smart window button or like your smart controls are like, they're eager to get open at all times. So there's also another function track to track. Come down here where it says configure track header you get all these options here. You get mute, solo, track lock, record enable, input monitoring, and then groove track. And I'll go back, come back to groove track when we're talking about the drummer. Um, track lock. You can see that these things as I click and unclick them, they appear over here. Um, all of these things are useful when you're recording. Some are more useful when you're mixing. Um, I don't know if they're distracting visually. This is just a place where you can <clears throat> add or subtract them to make sure that you have what you need so that you can quickly access and control each track. Um, mute does exactly what it says. It's the mute track. You can mute or unmute. So if you look at this guy right here, because my microphone is on right now, I'm muted. And then now I'm feeding back because once I open that, it can hear me talking to myself basically through the same computer. That's what mute does. The solo is just what it says. If there were multiple tracks here, it would simply unmute. It would give you, it would solo this track and you would only be listening to this track even if there were 15 below it. Lock, 
And if you notice what just happened there, this is the record enable button. This tells you that this is the track you're going to record on. And so when you hit this button, if there's only one track open, if all you have selected is one track, so we'll just add another track just for fun. Right now, you'll notice that this one's blinking, which means that if I do this right now, I'm only recording on this one track. I'm Now GarageBand doesn't make it easy to record on more than one track. That's kind of the downside of the program. It's about your input device. We'll get to that in a minute. But if this is not, uh, if I go down here and select this, now you notice that this is selected, I record, and now I'm recording exactly where I was recording at the same time because also if, this is really important, if you have the cycle button selected, you will start from the beginning of wherever your cycle is. For loop recording, that's super important. I'm gonna turn it off. I'm gonna delete this track and then I'm gonna press record again and you'll see that I will begin here at the beginning. Nope, I'm beginning where the playhead is because I didn't start it from the beginning. You begin recording wherever the playhead is. That was my point there. And ta-da, just like so. And now I'm recording down here. So that's, <clears throat> excuse me, my allergies are getting me. That's what that guy does. And that's how you arm your tracks. Cool thing is you wanna unmute multiple tracks. You can actually just, if there are a bunch of them, you can just scroll through them and unmute them all at one time just by holding down your right click or, no, it's actually, doesn't work as well with the trackpad, but if you have a mouse, all you do is hold down your mouse, click, hold down, and you can scroll straight down. And you can mute everything, or you can unmute everything, or you can, you wouldn't want to solo everything at once because that wouldn't be so long, but you can lock. Locking is super important because once you like something that you're doing, you lock it, you leave it for good. It cannot be recorded over. It cannot at all be disturbed. That is the beauty of the lock button. And that's a function that uh, I recommend you use often because it sucks to accidentally record over something that was really, really good. Um, this guy right here, basically standard fader, standard slider. Um, we're really looking at this if you're familiar with a normal mixing board, normally the volume faders for the individual tracks would run along the bottom. And that's what this represents. It's still a fader, it's still a track slider, whatever you wanna call it. It's just that in GarageBand, when you're in the project pane, your tracks are always gonna be like this. There is no other view. I'm sure at some point they'll modify it again because they continue to upgrade and do awesome things with this. But right now, this is just no different than a slider as though it were along the bottom and these were tracks that were vertical instead of horizontal. And the very last thing that's gonna be in your track window is your pan, right and left. Da -da -da. If you're into that cool stereo mixing vibe. And that is the whole of the interface. Any questions? No? Tweet. Well, moving on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this. Don't save. And we're going to start back here with basically empty project. Creating projects. And I went over this um, 
as we were just covering the project pain, but this is, it's really, really important. And it's sort of like, no matter what you're doing, I would recommend you always, even if you're working on the same project and you, if you're, especially if you're dragging in media, but you don't like something about it, just close, like go in, save the project that you're working on, close out of it, start over, empty project, because the awesome thing about GarageBand is each one of these projects is self-contained. So some, some, some digital audio workstations uh, drag information around and you, it's like, you know, whatever. It's like, you, you I, I won't even go down that road. I just really find it helpful to always, no matter what you're doing, start with a new and empty project, whether it's from a template or whatever, because you can just take one of your projects and you can, you know, you can, you can always choose to uh, at any time sort of copy the whole thing and paste it. You can always do that. Like just select everything like you would normally select, you know, whether you select all like that, just command A or whatever. And you can copy and paste the project into a new project. That's one way to do things. But for the most part, I would just always recommend whatever you're doing as you're sketching, as you're writing, as you're working on something, don't run the risk of destroying something you might love. So, and I'm just gonna do this, just project from scratch. And once again, I'm just gonna do this, uh, say I'm just gonna use a software instrument. When you're doing this, it's always the same process. You can add as many tracks as you need to. The important thing to know about these tracks is these color codes. And when you're creating, mm -hmm. ooh, see that? It got away from me for a second. When you're creating these, every single time you do, you wanna be as specific as humanly possible. You wanna know where your input is. Um, if you're creating a drum track like this, you don't ever have to do anything like that because this is all internal. But creating tracks is just that simple. So if you want to delete it, you select, select, delete, and then whatever. You're back to whatever. So as you saw, when I started, I started out with a software instrument track, but I just deleted whatever that was, that Steinway piano track. And this is ultimately always mutable. That's the other thing. You see how it had the editing, the editing panel and the library window were open. Other thing to remember is that it, it, it remembers what you had set up the last time you set up a track. So like right now, my count ins on, but my metronome's off. Every time you restart and start, always remember to go through to make sure your settings are where you want them because it just carries over. Which is back to why I say that if you're working on a project and you're feeling it out, maybe you're doing a podcast and you don't like the way you set a line or something didn't come in right and you're just like, you wanna try it a different way. You can just do multiple tracks, do another track, do another track, do another track. But sometimes just starting a new project gives you the freedom to not worry about destroying anything. And I think that's just an important thing to remember. So I want to talk about regions because that, let's do this. No, I'm going to do this. Um, that's the other important part of how you build projects individual regions and that's now if you look here in this little project here hey buddy so 
So you notice that you see these little sections here. Each one of these is a region. And depending on the type of instrument you're using, like right now I'm using loops, so all these are blue, but up here I have an internal drummer. So the drummer track is always gonna be this goldenrod kind of color. But the regions, <clears throat> as you use them, they organize by color. So if I were to add another track right now, and it was a software instrument, like MIDI track, I push create. And anything I put in here, even off key, anything I put in there is now green, just like that selection. And the reason why is because that's telling you what kind of information you're encoding. Um, the difference between these, uh, all these loop tracks are actual samples of people, musicians playing the actual <laughs> instruments. And so that's why if you look in here, you see waveforms, you zoom in a little bit, those are actual waveforms because these are real time samples. Now with the MIDI instrument that I just, this particular guy right here, if you look in here, you'll notice, and I'm gonna move the cursor over. I'm gonna close the library and I'm gonna close the smart window. Um, if we zoom in a little bit here, you'll notice that it's actually not waveforms because what this information is, <clears throat> this information is just mapping out. It's just the computer saying, these are the notes he played in whatever time at whatever time. And it doesn't care. <clears throat> wow, this, my voice is cracking like crazy, you guys, sorry. Um, it doesn't care what the information is. What it's gonna do is I can go in here and I can actually just, you know, oh, go to the library, change the classic piano. I can go to, let's see, let's do a melod, no, let's do B3, sounds cool. So I can switch that guy right here to, nah, nah, I wanna do this, I want this, I want the classic D6. Yeah, let's do that. So if I go back here, and we just solo this for a second. Now it's that. That's MIDI information. It does not care whatever you want. It will just input exactly what you played and then you can manipulate it as you choose. That being said, I'm going to destroy this track because that was garbage. All right, so that being said, how we doing? Everybody kind of following me here as I get into the regions? Any questions? No. Sweet. Um, are you, uh, so are you planning on creating some tracks for people to see? Kind of? Or I suppose you already have, but. Um... As far as, um, well, what, what kind of tracks, what are we talking about? There are multiple. I mean, I'm gonna get into different track types as we go here, but um, are, what are, what are I just, I'm curious as to what you want to see created. Uh, are you going to build a song? No, I'm not gonna build a full song. I did build this one before the class because I didn't wanna actually take the time to do this. And I built this out of the loop track, literally by dragging these guys in here and uh, building this one by one. And so that's actually where we're going next. <clears throat> it's just to talk about this. And rather than try to be like super creative on the fly, I just did this ahead of time. Um, is, uh, would it be helpful if I did just kind of do that? Is that what we're asking? I, I believe so, just... Um you know, some sort of demonstration of how it all comes together, I suppose. But, so, well, with this, just we'll just do this really quick. 
Um, like with this one, as we get into loops, this was just a basic, all I did with this guy right here, um, just as far as this project, I started this as a uh, just a new project. And what I did was go into the loop pack and I went to the funk genre and I just, I mean, really just pulled this. You see this, this particular drummer is over here. And let's see, instrument, I went to instrument, and I went to drums, I went to kits, and I went to Jesse. And then I found, oh, did I change it? I must have, because this is not obvious. Let's see, library right window. Let's see, yeah, I did. So basically, get out of there. Um, with this, I took a drummer, dragged it over here, put it on the track. And then with, I know you guys are seeing my mouse move around, but I'm moving the zoom controls out of my way constantly, sorry. Um, so you go over here. So I pulled my drum, I pulled it over, I drug it over here just like this, just like I could do this right now. Um, I could do, this and I can pull it over and now it just makes a new track and see it says Jesse down here and it's a drummer and it's intro and then if I were to just solo this out for a second so we can hear it and it's really that simple so I'm going to kill that for a second so I do that I'm going to turn the solo off and go back to the beginning <clears throat> And then, see right there, I selected kits. If I click kits again, all the instruments that are available to me in the funk genre without any particular description, if you go to grooving, which is what I did, you get a certain set of selections here. So drop the funk bass, one, that's this guy. And you can always just listen. Right? So you do that. Oh, come on, I'm not editing. Down here where it says drag Apple loops here, that's all I did. You just drag it just right there. And see how it pops up right here? Now I can put it wherever I want it. And in that case, I put it right there at the beginning. Now we're going to be really funny. I'm going to let them both play at the same time. And the beauty of this is, is that because I just chose C major, you know, all the white keys on the piano, it's easiest to just like, if you know your key, if you're like, you know, a big fan of like writing your music to a key, that's great. If you don't, totally fine, pick a key. Every single loop in here is in that key. Now, the funny thing about it is I can do this and I can say, I don't know. I think it would sound better in B minor. I do this, they all just changed. Because you know what? Now they're in B minor. Now sometimes if you do that, you don't get the best results because the thing about transposing is you really don't want to go very much farther than that's a semitone, a half note away, and then another semitone. You only want to go about two of those because then you'll lose some of your assets. They'll just kind of go away. Um, I'm going to go back to C major because I like it better. And that's the basics of how you build. Does that make sense? Or do you want to really see me do something on scratch scratch? I'm going to delete that. I think we're good. Awesome. And this is a, like, it's a crazy little tool. I mean, it's a really, let me see, actually, I might have another one in here that's, let me go to the iCloud for a second. 
because doo doo where's my iCloud? There she goes. Last of my phone. Nope, I don't have it. There is, and there's another one. You can do so much in here. Like, this is a rabbit hole we can get lost in all day. Um, <clears throat> but while we're here, I'm actually gonna you take this as an opportunity to show you that when you're doing music, this is the arrangement track. If you go up here, I don't know, it's not view. No, is it view? I'm so bad at this. <laughs> Sorry. It's not real. It's track. If you go to the track uh, header, you can see where it says hide arrangement track. You can do all this stuff. You can click a new track, track with duplicate settings. Like if you've got a cool setting and you want to do the same setting again and you don't want to reconfigure all your settings, you can do that. Rename your tracks, delete track, hide arrangement track. The arrangement track, well, yeah, let's do that real quick. The arrangement track while we're here is an interesting thing because right now you can see where it says intro and see how the intro is lined up here with this initial region. And then there's no verse here because there's no vocalist. But if this was a song with a verse, say it went here, that would be where that went, right? Kind of lines up with the next set of regions. I don't know. It looks like it might be a little longer than that. So if you need to keep track of your arrangements of songs, that's what the arrangement track allows you to do. And if you kind of put the head over here, the head selection is everything. Like it was the uh, GarageBand response to when you're doing things in in the uh, in the uh, control pane here, where you're doing all of your in the tra in the track window, any place the head is is where anything you do is kind of going to land. So if I were to say, you know, I don't know, stop and copy this, and then I were to paste it, it goes to where the head was. See that? Like it just jumps over there. So Command Z, undo that. So right now I want to add the next arrangement. Oh, look, it just immediately pops up chorus because that's what would come next. And that chorus seems a bit long because our song isn't that long. So you just drag it back. And but what if this part isn't the actual chorus? So if you hover over the name chorus and come on, buddy, hover over the name, it gives you the options. I would call this the outro. And I would probably actually not call this well, let's call that the course. And I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but this is a good time to do this. And this. <laughs> sounded like an outro to me. That was an outro. So that's how that's done with the loop packs in the loop settings. Everybody cool with that? Sweet. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna close this file. Now we're gonna get into the drummer. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna do this this way. I don't want to, yeah, actually I do. Um, let's do this. Let's do a new project. And we're just going to go straight for the drummer. Now, if you have not worked with the drummer in, um, yeah, if you haven't worked with the drummer in GarageBand yeah, and you're a songwriter, this is going to be your best friend um because let's just do with aiden i always do aiden i like aiden because uh, he turns up portland that's how specific these are um in terms of sounds you get like if you go down here and you look in your library 
this particular drummer, the drummers all have names because those are the names of the drummers that actually laid down these tracks. <clears throat> I'm going to turn on the loop bar for this so we don't get crazy. Um, you'll see Brooklyn, Bluebird, Detroit, Garage, East Bay, Four on the Floor. No joke, and you're going to see it. You can move through all of these. Now, in Smart Window down here, I'm going to manipulate this as I play this, and you're going to see what happens. This is a Portland Burnside, and here's Aiden. So, I'm going to manipulate his hi-hat sound. A little more complicated. How about a more complicated kick and snare? That's a little better. Too complicated. Let's make it a little more simple. So in this window down here, you can change between loud and soft. Simple and complex. You can manipulate your fills. Swing if you need to. That's swinging pretty hard. Less swing. Also, change the instrumentation because maybe that section needs simpler but louder toms. That's cool, but maybe I want the hi-hat back. Little symbols. That makes sense. Yeah, and like I said, you can do that all day. Each one of these songwriting categories has a different drummer, different world. I mean, each one changed drummer. There's Leah, she's doing what she's about to do. More complex. I don't know. Maybe it's not after hours. Maybe it's atmosphere. Let's see what Catalyst does. Yeah, that's the drummer. That's what that does. And sometimes it's an actual drummer programming beats. In the case of when we were up here with Aiden, it's an actual drummer that laid down these tracks. But they all played these are real sounds from real drummers and they're all thrown into this crazy AI algorithm thing that it does. And there's just a million different versions of it and you can play with it all day. So if your songwriting is like, you know, if that's your thing and you like are like me and you can't decide on anything and you need to like play infinitely with possibilities, the drummer function is going to let you do that. Everybody got that? Any questions? No, we're good. All right. We're good. Okay. Aiden. So, yeah, let's just close out of this one. Don't care if I save it. All right. So, the uh, next basic. So we didn't get into, well, if you're recording like track in, you will need some sort of audio interface. Um, I've got a PreSonus audio box that I'm using 
Um, you could use a Scarlet. You can use... There's a couple of different inboxes you can use. But you got to have some sort of audio analog to digital converter um, that goes in USB style. And that's what's going to allow you to plug in, whether it's guitars, whether it's uh, any sort of, you know, any microphone of any sort. That's how you get in and out of here. And um, there are a lot of different interfaces. But once again, GarageBand, like I was saying about the USB, uh, just your different MIDI controllers. It's really, really like you, there are not you know, there are, I would say there are a few things like anything that's destined or designated for Pro Tools, um, like the inboxes, like the basic inboxes. I don't think those work. I haven't ever tried. I have an old inbox and it doesn't work, but I think that's the thing for anything that's um, Avid Pro Tools designated. It won't work. Um, does anyone have any questions about this? Because it's kind of hard to do this part because uh, I have to like show you the thingy and it doesn't really matter whether I do. It's just um, you got to have an in like you got to have an input to record like this at all to do to get a microphone in and out of it. And um, you can get different devices for as little as fifty bucks and as much as a thousand, depending on what you, the level of control you want and the articulation and what kind of, you know, it depends on what you're doing. Um, does that make sense? Or does anyone have any questions specifically? Okay, I got a thumbs up. I think we're good. All right, sweet. Um, and basically, this is kind of where live instruments come in in general. Like if we were to do, you know, that initial track could have been a vocal track. Typically, when you're building a song, if you're in the music world, you know, if you're a podcaster, you're going to go mic in. That's your jam. Unless you work in reverse and then you like have some cool textural track that you just need to get in the mood so you can do your thing, you might, you know, do a line input using, you know, the audio track type. Um, or maybe you just want to do some cool MIDI sounding thing in the background, who knows? But basically, for the most part, if you're building music, usually you're going to start with your rhythm section, which is going to be your drummer, bass or guitar. And then you're going to get to like other instruments, keyboards, vocals, things of that nature. Um, taking a guitar or bass in. Now we showed the internal drummer. You can, with microphones, play, you know, send a live drum or anything you can record through a, on a microphone, you can send in through using the basic uh, microphone input section. So you can always do that. The thing that makes this particularly cool with connect guitar or bass is that if you have a guitar or uh, bass, you can actually just input directly in. And I would bore you with plugging a guitar in and doing it, but it's not going to change the fact that that's what it is. It's still the same interface. You got to have an audio interface of some sort that's going into the program to get what you want out of it. The cool thing about the basic audio tracks, like when you go and you select and just do a basic audio track like so, okay. um, is that you can always drag existing audio files from anywhere. Like if you just happen to have some cool files that are like, oh yeah, this is great. I'm gonna, I want this. You just drag them right out of your media browser and drop them right on the timeline and then let them play however or work with them however you need to and any questions about that we're coming up to eight o'clock and i was going to take like a five minute break and so if no one has any questions before i move into mini 
I might just take that five minute break sooner than later. Anyone, anything? Looks good, feels good. We're all good. I think we're good. All right, sweet. Thanks Cheryl, I like you. Okay. Uh, so basically we're, we covered the basic track types and um, I saw Cheryl, so I'm assuming we're all back. I don't know. I could be wrong. Cheryl, just nod. If anybody's not back, I'll blame you later. <laughs> anyway, um, so we covered all the basic track types and this just gets you in and out of the machine to do whatever you need to do as far as recording goes. Um, MIDI instruments, um, covered that a little bit and really what we want. Well, I think, let's do it this way. I think the, yeah, I think this is, this might be easier. The important thing, I mean, the input into GarageBand obviously is what's gonna set you up to go forward with it, whatever your project is. If you are going in and you're doing a MIDI style project and I'm just gonna use the keyboard collection. Come on, buddy. Why won't you let me choose? Um, the important thing to remember, especially with uh, each of these individual whatever choice you make like i said these are samples somebody individually went in and actually played individual notes um on each of these different keyboards so it's kind of cool because to the naked ear you can't really tell i mean they obviously if you know what one of these sounds like live yeah it sounds a lot different but good enough to get you where you're going the important thing to remember when you're recording any of this stuff is what I said before, is that your whatever you record is purely information. So theoretically, you can move this around and change what it actually is. That part of your reality as you go into editing. If you go down here and look at this, you can see down here, you can see each note that I played and how I played them, where I played them, they're in time or where they are or are not in time. That's all happening down here. That's what the little scissors up here, the edit window. There are two different ways to look at this. You can actually look at the score. If you're a music reader, this is pretty cool because you can play things and then you can go here to score and then you can print it or whatever you want to do, but it just gives somebody an ability to look at it. Um, the quantize function, if you're looking at it, right now we're looking at region and we can look at notes quantize function if you play slightly off the super cool thing about the quantize function i'm editing this a little bit is that when you use a midi instrument you can use the quantize function to get yourself back on the beat so i just changed to an eighth note quantize i'm going to move this whole thing over and start it at the top of the cycle. I'm going to turn on my cycle. 
I'm gonna make it go. No, I'm gonna shorten this. Wait, short. Come on, buddy. Oh, do that. Doesn't matter. Here we go. So you probably can't see it, but if you look right here, I'm gonna Command Z what I just did. I'm gonna Command Z it again. I'm gonna Command Z it again. Right here, it actually, it moves over. If you use this time quantize function, depending on what you're playing in, like obviously it gives you all of these different options in terms of quantization like you can if you're playing off like if you're playing outside the rhythm you go in you select you know whatever maybe it was 116th and then you go in and you're like i think this sounds like garbage so i'm gonna move it over you just basically have to let me do it down here let me edit, let me all you have to do is select the quantize function and whatever you have highlighted once you turn this on see that i don't know if anybody just noticed that and i'll undo it see that command z and i undid it and then i will turn it back on and it moves the notes over and what it's doing is it's moving them over to get them on that particular beat to the nearest 16th note now that may not be what i was intending to do but that's what that function does. That is not what I was trying to do. But if you need to do that, that is one of the beautiful parts of working with MIDI instruments because, you know, you have the idea of always being able to like tap into really cool sounds at any time and manipulate them at will and then once that's all done you can go back and if you read music you can just read what you've done or if you need to like give it to a piano player or whatever you got there it is so that is part of the now there is some really powerful programming that you can get into once you're into um, mixing and editing inside the MIDI world. Because when you're over here in Piano Roll world, let me select that again so we can see it. Always have to select the region that you want to see down here in your smart window and in your editing window. But um, I could just be really freaky and go, I don't think that note belongs there. Actually, no, nah, I think it's that note. No, nope. is it that note? Nah. That no, no, yeah. But what if I put it over here? So I can do that, and then yeah, that's just lame. Now, what you don't want to do is what I would normally do, and then just keep moving things around forever because you really can't actually just move them around. But having the options when you need to actually correct, especially. Like this is something that I use when I'm doing sound design for film and I really need like certain elements to all happen at the same time and if things are slightly off inside of a score, the, you can use this window to really line them up and make sure everybody's absolutely in line hitting on the exact same beat, which is where, you know, your display window up here comes in so you can actually see the actual time and the meter right exactly where you want to be. And that is what I want to cover in terms of MIDI. Is everybody cool? Or does anyone have questions? Sweet. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So when, yeah, let's do it this way. I wasn't going to get back over there. Good night.
Let's go back to our little demo here. So I just want to cover some basics of mixing when you're doing this stuff. Like I said, under normal you know, circumstances, you would be looking at, if you were looking at a mixing board in any other circumstance, you'd be looking down at it and these faders here on the left would all be down here horizontally with the faders working vertically. Each one of these volume knobs represents that exact same principle. And that's just the most important thing to remember when you're doing a mix because everything's headed out over here to your master volume, which I've got the master track enabled. So this up here, the master slider is this, this up here is the volume for this particular track. I like seeing the master track. There's nothing on it per se. There's no, you know, there's, you're never gonna, you don't put anything on the master track. It's just there hanging out. Um, and it's doing that because I actually have right here back at, you know, in the track drop down. You can hide the master track if you want. It doesn't need to be there. I, I'm just, you know, I've been an engineer for years. So I think in terms of uh, seeing my tracks individually, somebody's calling me. I just want to shut my phone off like I thought I did already. Okay. And the end game and what you're trying to do when you're mixing it all is just always balancing things. You always want to make sure that like nothing's sticking out more than anything else or whatever your game is. It doesn't matter. It's like, I like to think of mixing as doing a thing where you are looking at each individual instrument as being um, a part of a, a film. And the thing that you want to hear the most is the thing that should be the loudest until an event interrupts that moment and switches your attention somewhere else. Um, with that, when things like I dig this guitar, this guitar sounds a little loud, but see, I've got all these other instruments in, di in these different regions on the same track. So I've got a couple of options. I can put each one of these on a different track or I could be a little more, um, let's see. Let's do it this way. So if I select this guy and then I go up here, actually it's a mix. And so I want to show automation. Now what this does, if you notice these little yellow drop down menus just happened out of nowhere and everything just changed over here because what I can now do because that's what I'm here to do is I want to change the volume on this particular region so what I did is I just put a point here and I'm going to bring this whole section down I don't like that I didn't want the rest of it to be down. So I'm going to push that part back up. So when the song starts, I'm going to make the disco riser guitar just a little quieter. Not nearly quiet enough. Let's try it again. Oh yeah, now that was a little bit better, but now it seems like this guy, this piano is just a little too loud too, which we're just gonna manipulate. See what I'm doing? I'm just changing the volume on each of these. And you can do that with anything when you're in automation because automation is automating 
individual volume and panning changes. So if you like, I just click the, you know, Disco Riser guitar drop down menu and you see that it says up here, automation, volume, pan, echo, reverb. That's everything you can change. The thing that's in bold is the thing that we're working on. So if I switch to pan, that's gonna tell me how far left and right it is in the stereo mix. Oops, I wasn't, I was on drop the phone. I wanted to be on volume, I want here. I want to be in pan. And then it's the same thing. So it's gonna give me the option to, oops, move this. You can see as I move this left and right, far right. Yeah, anyway. That's how you do that. And automation is key to mixing. And that's what you do. So every time you basically, every time I, you know, have something selected, like when I'm in here and I put one of these marker points down and I'm moving this, that's giving the guitar the opportunity to switch from one side of the room to the other. And now if I start here, you'd notice that this pan knob is full left. And as soon as I start, it moves from left to right. That's what that little swoopy, but like I said, you can do that with all of these and where it says smart controls, if you're getting really elaborate with your mix and you can do this with anything, doesn't matter what it is. If you're getting really elaborate with your mixing and you're getting way down in the weeds, you can go into, let's see, here, here. All of your smart controls. So you can do the amount of your compressor, your lows, your mids, your highs, your ambience, your mid feed. You can control each one of these and make them subtly change as you want, however you want. You can bypass them. You can turn the reverb on, turn it off, whatever you want to do. That's the place where GarageBand gets really, really awesome and quite powerful. And you will find yourself uh, spending days overthinking everything. So you got to remember not to get too far into that. Any questions about automation? Sweet. Okay. Um, we're almost done. The, the last and most important thing, not the most important, but it's extremely important is when you've got this many tracks open and you're working on a mix, these little guys right here, and once again, if you wanna you always right click, configure track header, and these are the things that you have the opportunity to open at or close at any time, but locking a track, once you know what it is and once you know it's good, what this does it frees up your RAM. It frees up the memory in your computer so your computer will work more smoothly as you process, especially if you're doing video, because you can actually, you can add, um, you can add movie, you know, you can show the movie track. You can dump a movie in here. You can dump video in and you can be doing that. So if you've got video processing and it happens to not be like low definition, crappy video, and it's like high definition, it's going to bog down your processor a little bit. And so when you lock these tracks, it frees up your RAM so that you're, you're, you have more room to manipulate other things. And when you do this, as you play, see how it just, see how it says freezing? It literally just remembered every setting that I just did with all of those locked tracks. And now it no longer has to think about those. It can focus on the ones that aren't locked until I lock those. And um, once again, a great way to not lose valuable information because it totally blows when you think you've got something totally nailed 
and you got the right reverb and you got the right EQ and everything's really great and you forgot that it wasn't locked and you accidentally do what I did earlier and you select it and you change something and you don't know what you changed. It happens. I've been mixing like in, in various formats for 25 years. I still do it. It's a thing. And I just, it's like save, you know, you always want to remember to save, you know, save, 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 you know, command S, do what you got to do all the time. But then when you're in here and you're dealing with the individual tracks, just always like, as soon as you're done with something, press that lock key, get it locked down, shut it down. Don't think about it until you're ready to output the final mix. And that's where we're going next. Any questions about that? Cool. So those are all the basics of how to get in and out, get information in and out, um, to work within the program with MIDI instruments and so on and so forth to build whatever like dream scenario you want in whatever format and like you're doing and help, you know, it doesn't get too crazy. By the way, this guy, uh, catch the playhead. This, if this is on, your view will always be wherever this playhead is. And that's what that means. And it doesn't seem valuable until like you've got like something zoomed way in and then you're playing. And notice how you can't see the playhead. But if I do, all of a sudden we're on the playhead. Makes your life a lot easier. That's what that is. Forgot to mention that earlier. Um, once you're all, once all is said and done and you have, you know, the mix of your dreams and everything's going really, really great. The way to get information out of GarageBand is the share function. So you'll see here, if you've got a, a CD burner and you're like doing the CD thing, um, you can actually just burn song to CD if it's just a single song or export song to disc is the basic way to get in. Even if it's a, even if it's a, um, a podcast, it's still gonna say export song to disc. You export song to disc and it gives you the options of where you want it to go, you know, save as your tags. It gives you the options of like super high quality, MP3, AF, Wave, whatever you want to do. But that's what that does. And then, you know, if you've got like if you've got an external machine, you can like send it to an external, whatever. But that's how you mix down and get things out. And what it will do is it will send it out as a stereo mix, just left and right. It will not send this information. If you want to move this information, like if you want to move GarageBand will allow you to, you can transfer GarageBand into Logic. That is the only way you can actually take all of this information and export it to another DAW at all. So everything's GarageBand centric. And if you're doing, like if you have multiple Macs, like you can't see it, but there's an iMac right behind this computer and I share between these two worlds. Um, the other way to do sharing is to use the iCloud. And if you're doing that, it will take whatever you're using. Like if you, you know, save as, and then you go here and you go iCloud library. If your iCloud setup, it says GarageBand for Mac OS iCloud, you save, you save, and I already have this saved, so it doesn't need to be saved again. But that's how you do it. And then that allows you on any computer where you have access to your iCloud to immediately open this project and get to work wherever you left off. Doesn't matter whether you're here, Brussels, Belgium, Costa Rica, doesn't matter. As long as you've got access to iCloud, you can just port project wherever you're going. Those are the main ways to get things out. Um, you can obviously go into the file and you can just save the file uh, and you can put it on a disc or a thumb drive or whatever you want to do. But for the most part, the easiest way, because if you, if you were to save this to a USB, it will save this project file and you can just put in the USB and open it up in another Mac and just get going if they've got GarageBand. The thing is, they have to have all your same, uh, like if you're using loops especially, they have to have those loops. 
Um, every, they have to have everything that you have in order for it to transport. But other than that, that's the way you get information from point A to point B. Um, and really that's pretty much the way you archive your stuff. Even if you're never gonna use something ever again, you know, you're like, I did this. I don't know if I like it. It might be cool in five years. That would be the way you do it. Just put it because they're, you know, garage band files are completely intact as long as you're using the same version, basically, because it's, you know, it's a Mac based program. Three years from now, this very same thing may not open in the garage band three years from now. And it may, it may update and it may do something really weird. But for now, that's the best way to get from point A to point B. Um, any questions? Anyone? Thoughts? Answers? Can we actually talk now?